Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Dev Diary for Gilded Destiny. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Timor, and I have the privilege of working as the art director on Gilded Destiny. Before joining Aquila Interactive in late January of 2024, I worked at a company I think a lot of you are quite familiar with. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I begin, I want to say thank you to everyone who backed our Kickstarter, which ended earlier this month and earned almost £32,000 and reached 160% of the funding goal. My first job in the gaming industry was actually at Platinum Games in Osaka, Japan, and the very first title I worked on was Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. I'm sure a lot of you have heard rumors about how it is to work in Japan, and I dare say that at least 50% of those rumors are true. So in 2014, I got a job at Paradox Interactive and moved back to Sweden. Initially, I was working at Paradox North on the Magica IP, but when the studio was shut down, all of us were fortunately offered positions at PDS, Paradox Development Studio. I was at Paradox for 10 years until early 2024 and worked on just about every PDS title in various capacities. I have done just about anything from flags for Stellaris and icons for Europa Universalis 4 to loading screens for Hearts of Iron 4 and complete UI designs and redesigns for Imperator Rome. And now here I am working on Gilded Destiny. I hope to make this a user-friendly and aesthetically pleasing game experience without sacrificing any of its complexity and modability. Today I would like to show you some of the work I have done so far on the trade interface. If you wish to learn more about trade and its game design aspects, please have a look at the previous Dev Diary, Dev Diary 15, Trade and Logistics. First of all, as you already know, this is still a work in progress and may be subject to change. In fact, there are already parts of this interface that have changed while I was writing this Dev Diary. I would also like to mention that I am still fairly new to the team, so I cannot take credit for all of the art that you see here. Today I would like to focus on two things, hierarchy and interactivity. Let's start with the former. Hierarchy in UI is something we rarely think about as players, but it is so obvious when it goes wrong. For instance, if you saw a trade interface where the information concerning foreign trade was under the domestic header, it would be confusing to say the least. Just like the game needs a hierarchy for its various mechanics, the UI must be able to visually represent this hierarchy. Looking at the trade interface, it should be clear that there is a hierarchy of information being presented. This can be seen in the headers. First of all, there is trade. Within that, there is either domestic or foreign trade. Within domestic trade, there is the category of commercial diplomacy, among others. And within that, we have things like trade agreements and access agreements. Pretty straightforward stuff, right? Now, let's try to visualize this hierarchy through art. By giving each header a distinct look, we can create a visual language that can represent this hierarchy. When doing this, everything from the visuals of the font to the decorative elements of the background plays a huge role. Just as the header's level in the hierarchy goes up, the fanciness, if you will, needs to go down. For example, imagine if we switch around the level 3 and level 4 headers, like so. Here we can see at a glance that something is off. The level 3 header doesn't feel more important than the level 4 header. These are the kinds of things one needs to keep in mind when designing a visual language for a user interface. Effectively, we are creating visual rules for ourselves that can help the player read the UI at a glance and understand what is more important than what. Pop quiz time! If we were in need of a level 3 header that should function as a tab, can we simply reuse the graphics of these tabs here? The answer is no. The reason is simple. It would have the same fanciness as the level 2 header, causing confusion with the existing tab graphics, as well as simply not looking good. Now let's move on to interactivity. 
I would like to conduct a little experiment. Please take a moment to look at this interface and tell me which elements you think are clickable and which are not. Normally, of course, it's difficult to tell without being able to mouse over parts of the interface. Something grand strategy players often do is hover the mouse over every element on screen, looking for that mouse over effect to deduce what is actually a button and what is not. There's nothing wrong with doing so, but I dare say that this is a side effect of a, an unintuitive visual language. Ideally, one would want the player to be able to tell what is a button and what kind of effect it has merely by looking at it. The most obvious example of this would be a close button. Its position, color, and icon are things most computer users are very familiar with. Hopefully, when you look at this interface, you can see the pattern of what is clickable and what is not. But I'll leave the excitement of finding out if you are correct till the release of the game. I realize that I'm explaining something extremely basic and fundamental right now, but these are things that can very easily get out of hand when you have headers, tabs, text buttons, icon buttons, sliders, progress bars, menu buttons, flags, list entries, pie charts, graphics, scroll bars, collapsible menus, sort buttons, filter buttons, checkboxes, toggle switches, and so much more. <clears throat> As you can imagine, it can be quite challenging to create a visual design that is consistent across all interfaces. Sure, a close button is always a close button, but an icon button can be so much more. So let's take a look at a few variations of these. Here we observe three icon buttons outside of their natural habitat. They have yet to grow distinctive icons of their own and instead display merely a common question mark. However, even at this young age, they exhibit signs of the functions they will eventually serve. As we can see, the first button camouflages itself against the greenery of its background. It does not want to draw unnecessary attention and remains a subtle, unobtrusive member of the species. Although it shares its shape with the rest of its family, it bears tiny arrows on one side, which mark it as his sword button. The button in the middle is somewhat smaller, but its diminutive stature is deceptive. This creature holds the power to build factories, raise and lower market prices, and so much more. This is an action button. Last but not least, we come to the largest of the trio. Aside from its green edges, there appears to be very little relating this button and its cousins. Yet the primary connection lies not in the color of its edges, nor in the drop shadow effect. Instead, it is in its leathery texture and the distinct pigmentation of its icon that we find evidence of their shared heritage. For this button is a menu button. Like its fellows on the left side of the screen, it is capable of guiding the player to other menus and other habitats, where even more buttons can be found. And that concludes this dev diary. I hope you found this informative and entertaining. Although we barely scratched the surface, hopefully this gave you a small glimpse into the intricacies of UI art and the thought that goes into it. Thank you very much for watching.